So welcome everyone to um, this public lecture from Thomas Lecure. Uh, today's lecture marks the final event of Tom Lecure's Distinguished Visiting Fellowship at Queen Mary. Um, we've been excited about Tom's visit for some time. Yeah, so Tom was originally due to join us in autumn 2020. Um, so before I introduce him, um, I would like to thank those members of the Pathologies of Solitude team, Barbara Taylor, Claire Whitehead and Tasha Pick, who have worked tirelessly rearranging and rescheduling plans for Tom visit, Tom's visit, as well as Matthew Hilton, June Ride and Adrian Armstrong at the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences at Queen Mary, um, whose support has made this visit possible. Thanks also to Markman Ellis, Rodri Haywood, Mary Rubin and Sam McBean, who have helped put together a diverse programme of events for Tom's visit, and for all those who have contributed. Um, finally, thank you, Tom, most of all. Uh, it's been definitely worth the wait. And wonderful to engage with your work over the last few weeks. Tom Lecure is the Helen Fawcett Professor of History at UC Berkeley. Um, his multifaceted work spans the history of medicine, social history, history of experience, gender, sexuality, and human and non-human relationships. His writing appears in numerous publications, including regular contributions to the London Review of Books, as well as the journal representations where he's been on the editorial board since its inception. His books include Religion and Respectability, Sunday Schools and Working Class Culture, Yale University Press, 1976, Making Sex, Body and Gender from the Greeks to Freud, Harvard University Press, 1990, Solitary Sex, A Cultural History of Masturbation, Zone Books, 2003, and The Work of the Dead, A Cultural History of Mortal Remains, Princeton University Press, 2015. Tom has also been a great friend of the Pathologies of Solitude project, um, not only as a steering committee member, but also an insightful discussant and contributing, contributing to our research colloquia. Um, work such as Solitary Sex have been central to shaping our thought uh, and challenging how we think about solitude. It's also no secret or perhaps no surprise that the Pathologies of Solitude team is a group of animal lovers. Um, so we are thrilled to engage with Tom's current research project on the gaze of the dog in Western art. And that brings us to the title of his lecture today, Canines in Solitude, the gaze of the dog in Western art. Um, I think Tom's gonna to speak for about 40, 50 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. So please join me in welcoming Tom Lecure, um, who I'm gonna hand over to now. Charlie, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And just could I align myself with all the people, with all your thank yous to the people who made my visit possible. Um, obviously, Barbara Taylor, uh, I want to thank Natasha Pick for guiding me through um, a difficult three weeks with many changes, including um, my coming down with COVID at the beginning. So I'm very grateful to, to everyone, um, especially Tasha and, and Barbara. So <clears throat> I'm just speaking today about um, canines in solitude. And it it's, um, it's a way of thinking about my larger project, uh, uh, book project now, which is called The Gaze of the Dog in Western Art. So the world's museums are full of dogs. They're there in greater numbers and doing more different things with humans, with gods, amongst themselves than any other animal. They're there in the most famous paintings in the canon and in thousands of others. And by the late 19th century, they begin to be there in millions of snapshots and movie pictures. <clears throat> the question I want to answer tonight is what are they doing there in such large numbers? And what does this have to do with the problem of human solitude? One answer to the question is internal to art. It's a consequence of the dog's gaze. The dog is emblematic of looking itself. The visual artists, I'm gonna talk about see with the eyes of a dog or invite us to. A dog and a painting look sometimes as a surrogate for the painter, sometimes it looks for the viewer, sometimes for the people in the picture. It meets our eyes looking in on the world of an image. It looks under and into spaces, toward and away from people, calling this to our attention. So I wanna just illustrate this point by looking at Reynolds' picture of the fourth Duke of Marlborough and his family. And if we look at this, this sort of a canine um, Rachel Whitebread looking under the chair, 
Um, there's a dog looking at the girl in the middle. There's a dog looking in, in, in the direction in the, from the uh, in from the right. If you look at Peta de Hochs, uh, the letter, the central dog's look seems to define the boundary between the space of the painter where we stand and the world out of doors. And the dog on the woman's lap looks at the messenger. I could go further and say that what and how the dog sees is at the heart of the visual logic of the great swath of Western art. A character in Oran Pamuk's novel, The Color Red, is onto something important when he says that, quote, the infidel masters have committed an unforgivable sin by daring to draw from the perspective of a mangy dog. Yeah, I of the masters of the undeniable allure of the painting they make by these new methods. They depict what the eye sees just as the eye sees it. They paint what they see while we paint what we look at. I take that point. But I want to understand the dog's gaze. That is the way it engages with what it sees more broadly and suggests that it stands for the way in which the social world is represented in art. Through its gaze and more generally through the gestures of attention to what humans do, to where we do it, to the, the regard of the dog is foundational to sociability in art. And that's how we might imagine sociability in the world around us. It's an animal version of how regarding <clears throat> works for us. Adam Smith argued that the moral bonds between individual self-interested humans were possible because we act in a way that others seeing us would approve of what we do. As a species, he thought we wish to be observed, to be attended to, to be taken notice of with sympathy, complacency, and approbation. Perhaps dogs act as they do toward humans because they feel the same way. But for us, maybe more specific for us as represented in Western visual art, the dog's gaze and more generally its body and its relationship to ours enacts the attention we seek in the social world. Dogs are doing what we so deeply want from them. I come to this from John Berger, whom I came through through this project. With their parallel lives, animals offer man a companionship which is different from any offered by human exchange. Different because it's a companionship offered to the loneliness of man as a species. Dogs are the friend of last resort. Or with less emphasis on a human category, the creature who seems consistent to care when none of us do. It's an old theme and also one that we see in evidence every day on the streets of our cities. At least in the imagination of the court painter Daniel MacDonald, the village we see it in his village funeral, where a dog looks into the grave of its master, who presumably died of starvation in the great hunger. You see this in the middle. In fact, the trope of dogs looking into the graves of the poor is something one sees over centuries. If to be the object of another's unwavering and ending loyal attention, the attention of someone who we think we understand and we think understands us, the dog is the creature above all others that saves us as a species from loneliness. The unrelieved and sometimes intrusive thereness of the dog that people who prefer cats find so annoying is built into its DNA. Cats have their own lives and retain much of their undomesticated selves, their wildness, their strangeness. If cats seem to us the most inscrutable of the animals we live with on an intimate basis, Remember when I'm playing with my cat, how do I know my cat is not playing with me as Montaigne? Dogs <clears throat> are the opposite. A Cheshire dog in Wonderland would be absurd. Horses enter civilization by being broken. Think of the myth of Pegasus. Dogs do not need to be broken. They are born into human culture. Before going any further, let me offer a short and ruthlessly redacted list of examples of the visual record I'm, I'm considering. That is to say the dogs in the in the in the the top in, in, in the great canon um, of the West. Giotto Scrivoni Chapel frescoes of the life of the Virgin at the dawn of the Italian Renaissance. I'll come back to it. All three of Dura's found, foundational masterprints. One is curled up as you see on the left, a melancholy of dog, but one as dogs are in so many of the images of men and women alone in their studies. One is charging forward next to the horse in, the, in death in the night, eager to get where it's going with its human. And five in Saint Eustache, 
looking every which way and forming collectively the foundation of the image. Pair the Cosimo's death of Procris, in which the large brown dog in the foreground mourns the dead nymph, and the three dogs in the background, you see them for allude to a prelapsarian world in which humans and animals were not estranged. Velasquez's lot of the spectacular morning dog. Velazquez Las Meninas, probably the most written about painting in Western art. Dark and prominent, Antonio Palomino wrote of the dog in 1715. It gives great harmony to the composition. Picasso must have thought so too. He painted 15 versions of it in his studies of Las Meninas, all with the dog's eyes, central to the image. Lump, his dachshund, would place Philip the Fourth's mastiff. Titian's Death of Action at the National Gallery, left unfinished in his studio. Four astonishing dogs, painted in great sweeps of broadly applied color as if they were arrows shooting from Diana's stringless bow and about to take down their master, who'd been turned into a stag by the goddess whose modesty had is compromised. In fact, three of the completed poesy paintings, the great poesy paintings, the Diana of Action, um, the Venus and Adonis, and the Diane Callisto, commissioned by Philip II, have dogs. Goya's El Perro, where the dogs look through the kind of unspeakable pathos from some indefinable depth, sand, the sea maybe, into heaven or light, or maybe politely splashing about in Stella Tilliard's reading. In the Prado, it's hung where the altar might be, if the Black Period room were a chapel. Miro on his deathbed asked to see it and Las Meninas one last time. Corbet's major masterpiece, there's many of them, I'm showing you a very little or none, where the dog's gaze directs our attention to the departure of the mourners as it looks toward the edge of the image and its world. And then in the vast reaches of late 19th and 20th century popular art, Rin Tin Tin, Bullet, Toto, the dogs that of belonging to to uh, to um, to Bogart, Colette, uh, and 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 endless neon. So let me step back, step back and ask, <clears throat> what accounts for the dog's gaze itself? The answer is in deep in the deep historical time of biology. Evolution has created Incanus familiaris, a species that looks into our eyes, and we into theirs. How exactly and when this happens? is much debated. The cat and the dog families went their separate ways well before our more distant ancestors came along about 50 million years ago. Social canids would live with another social species, humans in Africa on a scale of hundreds of thousands of years without anything happening. Then sometimes around 50,000 years ago, one species of social canid that lived in a hierarchically ordered group and that communicated and hunts through its eyes that's to say the proto-gray wolf, met another such creature, he met us, under new and difficult conditions, the ice age, and slowly there evolved the dog. Dogs were first, were the first domesticated animal by about 10,000 years. The animal, which may well have been out of humans to conceive of the possibility of domestication itself, a sort of model. They were the first animal that could live comfortably and share our domus. And specifically on the point of the gaze, no animal lives more in the visual field of humans than the dog. It's uncannily attuned to our gestures. None is better at consistently reading our wishes and emotions. Dogs are interested in us as a species, in the species we inhabit, and in doing with us what we do there, hunting, guarding, herding, hanging around, and pretty much everything else. In the lives we share, evolutionary biology meets culture. It's the intimacy of the dog with our species that interests me. It occupies a position at the boundary where the human animal meets the rest of creation. Ruskin thought that the artists of the Renaissance, Venice, Titian, Veronese, Carpaccio, painted dogs to give the fullest contrast to the highest tones of human thought and feeling. They attracted these painters, he thought, not because they were the basest of animals, but the highest, the connecting link between man and animals. This may be a claim about their place in the great chain of being. It's certainly not about an imagined evolutionary genealogy. It's a status conferred on them by artists who thought of dogs on a social and moral 
continuing with humans. Our nearest biological relatives, the chimp, is not even a contender for the dog's role, even though it shares 96, 98% of our genes, where we have something on the order of 82 to 84% in common with dogs and about 90% with cats. It'd be hard to imagine, if not impossible, writes Jane Goodall, to produce a chimpanzee who could live with humans and have anything like as good relationship as we have with our dogs. This is not a matter of intelligence, however understood, but of the capacity, she says, to help, to be obedient, and to gain our approval. She learned from her dog, Rusty, that she says animals have minds, personalities, and feelings, which gave strength to the convictions that informed her life's work. Dogs are, in a sense, a kind of liminal creature. Diogenes, the younger contemporary of Plato's, was known as the dog philosopher because he lived a life at the boundary borderlands of culture the life of a dog on the street, close to nature. He was not, he could not have been the cat or the horse or the donkey or the bird philosopher. There's no equivalent thinker for other species. If we were to think of a continuum of the visual, literal figure, of, of the visual and literary figuration of animals, we might put birds at one end. They stand in a metaphorical relationship to us, a parallel world on another level. It takes on various meaning. Think of doves in paintings of the Annunciation or dead pheasants in Dutch still life paintings. But dogs have come to stand in for us by virtue of their cultural proximity. They're metonymic creatures, almost human in all sorts of ways. From ancient China um, to medieval and Renaissance Europe, those at the borderland were taken to be civilization were imagined as sinocephalic, humans with dogs' heads. On the left, you see the 15th century uh, Nuremberg Chronicle version of a, of a, of a dog-headed human, and the right, a 17th century icon of, of St. Christopher uh, from Cappadocia. But more importantly for me, they're often the surrogates of artists and are represented as animal witnesses to our lives. There are two ways to approach the questions of how dog made their way specifically into Western art, which in turn, um, uh, uh, it accounts for why they're there in such in such large numbers. But before I get to these two approaches, let me make a negative point. Dog, dogs aren't there simply because there's so many dogs around. Art, as we all know, does not imitate nature. If anything, it's the other way around. We expect to see dogs in certain contexts because they have been the subject of art. Dogs in the real lives of people in the past do not translate into dogs in the art of, of the time. We know, for example, that dogs hung around the brickyards of ancient Ewer 4,000 years ago. They left their footprints in wet clay tiles that after firing were used in the building of temples. Ghostly reminders that they were there. This one is actually from Berkeley, but there, there are many around. But no art from the ancient Near East records either such stuffs in clay or the presence of dogs in brickyards. Brick making was not something that interested artists of the art commissioning classes. Hunting was, and consequently, we have bas reliefs of hounds on aristocratic hunts for about 2000 BC. But reversing the terms, i.e. nature imitates art, as the philosopher Nelson Gubin argues, is too timid a dictum. Rather, he says, nature is a product of art and discourse. We make the world we live in as creatures and culture through symbols and signs. Works of art constitute a symbolic system, the interest of art is cognitive, and dogs and art constitute part of that symbolic system. Yet, by the way, we make our world by insisting on the social and affective connections between humans and animals and between the separate and distinguished elements in a painting. In other words, dogs in art help us to see and understand the world we live in. Let me fill in this abstract formulation of my claim. One way of doing this is through looking at the connection between dogs and perhaps their wolf ancestors and primal human activities that have for 10,000 years or more been represented in art. The hunt is the obvious case. The first art for art's sake as Robert Colasso calls it. The earliest representations of humans joined in an activity with any animal is a hunt scene carved in a rock face sometime between the early sixth and we're likely the ninth millennium BC in what's now Saudi Arabia. The hunt is the stuff of life, of encounters between man and gods, between the hunter Actian and the god.
allowed us to hunt Diana Artemis, for example, who turns him into a deer, into prey, as punishment for gazing on her nakedness. It was a subject in the art of ancient Greece, and given the centrality of ancient art in the Western tradition, and of Ovid, who tells this tale, more than 2,000 years later, we have Titian's version of Diana and Actian, in which the hunter's dog, you see on the left, enters into the frame just as clueless or as voyeuristic as his master, although both seem more focused on the nymph hiding behind the column than on the goddess. Diane's dog seems angry before she quite takes in what's happened. Look also at the way the dog defines, I'll go back to show you this, the dog defines the boundary of the painting. It's half in and half out, you see on, on, on the left, but unquestionably looking and coming in. The social history of hunting generates an almost endless a range of images, even without mythic protagonists. Until the 19th century, they're almost unrelievedly about men and masculinity. The tired hunters returning with their tired dogs and borgles winter. The dogs that worked with lone hunters in 19th century America. Their queens with dogs. Uh, Anne of Denmark, um, concert of James I with dogs and also the poor in violation of the privilege of the rich, two images of poachers. Guarding, the other primal role of the dog is almost as generative of culture and art. It is, I think, what accounts for the status of dogs as gardens of the dead from ancient Greece to Egypt to Aztec Mexico and Zoroastrian Persia. But the art I want to think about is about more ordinary guarding and gazing. Dogs guard sheep and accompany shepherd, and so become part of their stories and the imaginative world in which they're engaged. They listen attentively as a shepherd plays the flute, an image born of pastoral poetry. As in the detail you see on the left from an altarpiece by Simon Conigliano that depicts the murder um, of, of St. Of, of Peter, of, of, of um, St. Peter of Bologna. Maybe the dog listening to the shepherds is a synecdoche for all those who listen to Peter murdered by his Cathar enemies. <clears throat> the sheepdog on the left looks longing to heaven, again, its eyes directing our attention when its master, the beautiful shepherd boy, Ganymede, is abducted by Zeus to be his companion on Olympus. On the left, you see Michelangelo's version of the dog is sort of faint there on, on, on the left. I hope you, it's, you can see it. And these two images from the early 1530s became memes in 16th and 17th century painting and emblem books for the loneliness of those left behind. Someone on earth, the dog, suffered loss and is bereft because Zeus wanted a companion. The Renaissance art historian Giancarlo Peretti writes of the dog left behind in the Correggio, listen to the barking in the painting. The dog is the one saying goodbye. Something like that maybe could be said about Goya's dog. In sum, all the many things that humans and gods and heroes do with dogs generate an art that represents their conjoint lives, their lives as witnesses, as those who see us. One final example, which I can't, which I can't resist, is Hercules's dog discovering royal purple as he bites into a shell on the island of Tyr as his master Hercules is off to court uh, the nymph Tyro. Let me now turn to a second approach to the deep social cultural history of the dog in art. It's not through what we do with them in myth and real life, but through how we think about thinking. In 1962, the great French anthropologist of his generation, Claude Lévi-Strauss, said that animals are not just good to eat, they are good to think, usually translated as good to think with. He was writing about totemism and the many ways animals that humans used to differentiate themselves in the tribes and clans, bears, lions, otters, alligators. But dogs are a special case. Dogs in the Western tradition are good to think about the nature of rational thought itself. What are we to make of the question first asked by the Greek Stoic philosopher Chrysippus in the third century BCE, and began by James I in a debate in Cambridge in 1615, whether hunting dogs can solve an Aristotelian disjunctive syllogism. If not P, 
and not Q, then R, not P, not Q, therefore R. The dog, he, that is, as they Chrysips observe, will sniff one pass looking for its master and finding no scent, tries the second. And if there's no scent there, will, without further sniffing, go down the third path. Art has little to say about whether dogs do logic, but it takes for granted in many images that dogs know how to guide the blind to all manner of hazard. The most literal sense of the dog's gaze in art and what it does for humans. How do they do that has engaged philosophers over the centuries. Montan, who writes brilliantly about this example, describes how a dog calculates whether it and its blind master can navigate the narrow passage side by side or not. It's Bruegel, the blind uh, organ grinder led by a dog you see in the center. Painters are thinkers and dogs are there in art to think about big questions, the nature of ethical obligation and political duties, about the human condition, about the nature of friendship, about our loneliness as a species, about love and pain and loss. Perhaps they are, in this regard, first among animal equals. No single species over the ages is so deeply indicated in the mythic structure of human imagination speaking from around the world. God had a dog in the California Keto Indian myth and in many other stories. And they continue to offer companionship. Or more specifically, a locus for imagining that an animal cares sufficiently to assuage the loneliness of man as a species. Art mobilizes the dareness of a dog for its own purposes. In the story I'm telling today, there's an inflection point where deep structures, the biology and the historical anthropology of the dog become grounded in history when the dog sees and notices and attends to become an important feature of Western art. It's 1300 when Giotto began his life of the Virgin Cycle in the Scavoni Chapel. Vasari claimed in his 16th century lives of painters that Giotto initiated the great art of painting as we know it today. Present at that creation was the dog. According to the apocryphal Gospel of James, the aged Anne, wife of Joachim, and the mother to be of the Virgin Mary, was childless. In the first scene of the cycle, the rejection of Joachim's sacrifice, Giotto's attention is on the emotionally fraught moment when the priests of the temple refuse Joachim's sacrifice because, in their view, Anne's barrenness was a sign of God's displeasure. He looks at them over his shoulders in abject disbelief. The priest's eyes speak the rejection. In the second scene, Joachim has fled into the desert where he meets shepherds. They give no sign of greeting, uncertain why their master is there, surprised perhaps at the presence of so august a figure and distraught at seeing him so far from the city. The shepherd nearest Joachim looks out of the corner of his eye at the other. He looks back at him. Both ostentatiously avert their eyes from Joachim. Not so the dog, which makes its first time ever appearance in a story that had been frequently represented in Byzantine art and Western illumination. It's neither an allegorical dog, nor a dog actively engaged in its work, the sheep would take care of themselves, nor a dog needed for the reality effect. It stands in front of the stranger whose head is bowed in sorrow. Giotto depicts it as it gets up on its hind legs, both paws were off the ground, as if in the next moment they will come to rest on Joachim's cloak. It raises its head, wags its tail, and looks Joachim straight in the face. He returns the look, an utterly banal gesture, and not in commonplace, but a moment in the recognition of humanity, of caring, of energy, and joy. Dog meets saint. Joachim is less lonely. Giotto captures an imagined moment like that which the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas describes when a dog named Bobby in a German forced labor camp recognized him and his fellow prisoners as human beings by greeting them as they returned from their barracks. The last Kantian in Germany, he says. If Levinas were reflecting in his study on the moral capacities of a dog, he wouldn't have said that. Animals in Kant are not capable of, of acting on or responding to moral claims. And Levinas was a Kantian, but dogs, Bobby in this case, are capable of acting as if they could. And Levinas is accordingly moved by the gesture. A creature cares. That's what Giotto's painting exemplifies. That is what enters into our imagination. 
Let me take one more example of what dogs do for an artist. That is how artists think with dogs by considering one of Veronese's uh, best known and his largest uh, painting, 6.7 by 10 meters. This is the one that Napoleon stole from Venice above all others that he could have taken, the wedding feast of Cana. It now stands in a very large room in the Louvre, easy to see because it's on a wall opposite the Mona Lisa, which draws the crowd to the side of, of, of the room. Beginning at the top left of the picture, you look at the top quarter of this large image, and I'm going to show you a detail. At the top left of the picture, the dog is looking down through a balustrade directly at Jesus. Humans further along are looking elsewhere. At the bottom left, defining the edge of the canvas, a dog comes upon the scene and upon the painting. The brilliant white of its furs begins both the great swath of white cloth a bit further up that would take our eyes to the central figure and also the one along the bottom, the line of white that defines the tiles, the shimmering brocade of the cloth of the musicians, and almost as intense as the white fur on the two greyhounds you'll see in a moment. So this is the dog literally ent entering from the outside, entering, entering into, into the picture. For, moving further right, the two dogs in the center, greyhounds are at the viewer's eye level and form the base of the painting's central axis. We look upon them up to the figure of Christ. The one at the left looks at the floor with maybe a glance at the dog entering, but really it has a look of being there, near sleep, maybe, but watchful, a quiet pose that we'll see again and again. Dura's Melancholia one and its epigons are exemplary. It's profoundly present. Its weight near the exact midpoint of the painting anchors the party. The dog's companion looks the other way. Its body, by contrast to that of its partner, leans right and invites us to move our right eyes in that direction. It may be looking over at the cat, which, as is common with cats in much of Western art, is paying no attention to the action in the picture. Or perhaps it's looking, the, the dog in the center is looking at the last dog you see on the table as we scan them from the left to the right, the small one intent on the food. Oh, if I could only pray, Luther says of his dog, Patopa, the way this dog watches the meat. The dog and the art in this art is about attentiveness. More than three centuries later, dogs are still seen for the artist and for the viewer, but they're seeing in a different world. Gustav Kai's boat, the Roper Bridge, is exemplary. It's not easy to understand what's going on in this picture and in terms of who is who and who's looking at whom and what's going on. That's characteristic of the painting of modern urban life. It's not easily illegible, except for the dog who knows exactly where it's going and what it sees. Its owner is, if we can guess, about six feet back, just a little in front of the spot from which the painter sees the scene and creates its perspective. In a formal sense, the dog's gaze is crucial to how the picture works. It's as if it's establishing the lines of sight as they recede into the distance. But the dog is also a flaneur, the surrogate in this case of the painting. Maybe the doppelganger of the man in the top hat and that both seem to be looking at the woman with the umbrella and for us. So, so far I've suggested that dog and art functions primarily through its gaze, through what and how it engages what it sees in the world um, of a painting. I then paid attention largely to the formal aspects of painting, to how dogs see like painters. Like a dog, Cezanne says, that's how a painter must see the eye fixed and almost avert averted. This is Sebald in the poem about how dogs see in art. But I want now to reverse the terms. Rather than talking about what dogs can tell us about art, I want to tell us what art can tell us about dogs, or more specifically, what can tell us about how humans imagine dogs as witnesses, as creators of sociability and companions in solitude. I want to talk about the nature of sociability itself. If, as the philosopher Stanley Cavell argues, it's not what one does with one's friends that matter, but that what one does, one does with one's friends, then on these grounds, it's because we do so much with dogs, dogs might be imagined to be our species' best friends our most loyal companions. There are dogs in taverns and farmhouses of 17th century Holland. The dog barks at the drummer that accompanies the night watch in Rembrandt's paintings. There are the dogs 
in the crowds of late, 19th, late 18th century Boston, the Boston Massacre, and the French Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution, and the revolutions of 1848. You see one on the on the in, on the on the lower right hand side, 48, as both as witnesses and as participants. Boggs witnessed our lives in city squares from Venice, the Venice of Carpaccio, to the Paris of the Impressionists, to the present. They take walks with the gentry in, 18th, in the 18th century countryside and with the bourgeoisie along the Seine in the 19th. There are dog voyeurs, dog gawking at crowds, gawking at an accident in Jerome's painting, or rather in the print of it by Bouillard of the now lost painting. They're in the studios, in the studies and laboratories of scholars. Paco Bray has one in his observatory. Christine de Pissan has two in her writing room. St. Jerome um, has the dog in, in Duras. And you see the dog on the left is the line, of course, is the line of St. Jerome, but the dog on the left is, is the, the same dog that you have in, Mel in, in, uh, in Melancholia One. So does St. Augustine have a dog that either is seeing in a platonic way the, uh, the divine light or is asking for a walk. Justus Lipsius famously had his dog with him in his study and had himself portrayed on the frontispiece of these two of his works with one hand on the book and the other on his dog looking out the frame at potential readers. It's the dog that mourns him in Rubens, the four philosophers. So Lipsius is in the fur and is, is, is dead and Lipsius, the students, Volvarius is on the right, um, to, is the man to whom uh, Lipsius entrusted his dog. And here in the little detail, you see the dog again entering into the picture and, and get, paying attention um, to his new master. By the late 18th century, they seem to have been imagined to be part of the lives of even improvident families, as well as of, of, of the most respectable. And, certainly so in the late 20th century. Richard Avedon, one of the 20th century's greatest portrait photographers, writes that when he was young, his parents used to borrow a dog for their family portraits. The dog in the family portrait is now generic. It's just from a drugstore uh, frame on sale um, in a small California pound. The Obamas did not need to borrow a dog. So for much of the history of Western painting, the dog in, in portraits of women goddesses and the occasional queens accepted tended to be small. The mythological, religious, and historical subject of the most prestigious art demanded large dogs to accompany its male subjects doing what they did. In the 19th and 20th century, women and painters were choice. The dog engaged in a new, engaged in a new sort of self-fashioning, a new kind of subjectivity, a new sociability for women as they took their place both inside and outside the home. Aikens, the artist and his wife with a setter dog. And Whistler's 1864 Symphony in White Number no. 2 are good examples. For the first time, women are routinely painted with large dogs as their companionship. The same kind of argument might be taken for family portraitures without a patriarch. Renoir's Madame de Champartier and her children, for, for example. Um, and I might add here that the family dog on whose back Georgette sits represents also an exemplary rethinking of the emotional economy of a family, perhaps not a radical departure from 18th century precedent, but a translation of their conventions into new kind of formal and effective language. First time I think we have some sitting on the dog. The family dog became a commonplace subject as did the dog as a kind of doppelganger, a witness to their lives, a special friend to women. Like the dog's of Renaissance scholars, the dog and women's vernacular spaces became a convention. And it's also in the case in, in the literature with Barrett Browning uh, and the Brontes um, and, and, um, and Dickinson um, and, and so on. That's another subject. The fact that we've come to imagine the sociability of the dog and its role as witness to our lives speak also of the power of the opposite, the power of the bereft dog that exemplifies a deep loneliness an unacceptable solitude. It's this thread running from Goya's El Perro, which I'm sure to show you again, to the present. Turner's 1841, Dawn After the Wreck, where a dog between sea and sky 
howls into an empty sky. Suraz Sunday on the Karajat, in which a large, maybe homeless, certainly colorless dog is sniffing, maybe foraging near holiday makers who pay no attention to him or in fact to each other. Franz Marx Hund vor der Welt, a dog before the world, a painting representing Marx's beloved Rossi that he'd originally wanted to call, this is how a dog will see the world. Metaphysical dogs. The dogs who from Brazil to Calcutta to London supposedly have an exceptional capacity to understand human gestures, so lonely dogs, who also exemplify solitude and the misery of homelessness. The new technology, the age of mechanical reproduction, made possible a logarithmic expansion of the old in ways the dog is depicted as an exemplary witness. The advent of the Kodak number one in, 19, in 1888 and the Brownie in 1900 brought image making within the reach of millions. The dogs in human lives became dogs in pictures more than all previous ages, sometimes staged, more often not because the dog was just there. In the age of mechanical reproduction, it's the age of mechanical reproduction that created the vernacular dog. By just being there in an age before moving pictures, we it, just being there in age before moving pictures learned to separate the world from the film frame. In Lumiere's film, for example, or early Edison's, dogs are constantly entering movies. In fact, I think Edison actually, in one of his very first films, uh, had a man exercising for 30 seconds, and he put a dog in the picture to, to watch the man exercise. Uh, in Lumiere's films, the very early films, the dog just sort of wanders in. It's, um, as I say, it's because it, they haven't yet distinguished the, in the frame of the, the frame of the picture from, from, from the outside. Art photography, born also of new technological developments, the like a camera, for example, created still more possibilities for representing the dog's gaze and sociability. For talk to photography and allied technologies, the dog also entered the world of advertising. The most famous image, the most popular image um, until trademark until very recently um, is his master's voice for RCA. The probably until I say Adidas and so forth, probably the most recognized trademark in the world. It's the portrait of a mixed breed dog named Nipper, mostly a Jack Russell Terrier, who lived with his owner in a Bristol theater where he worked. And in this painting, gazes into darkness from which a voice emanates. I want to end with images of the dog's gaze in the homelessness and COVID lockdown crisis. A very long history of humans and dogs that stretches back to the Paleolithic might account for the fact that dogs are the companions of last resort. But I want to really end by pointing out how powerfully the visual traditions I've been telling you about is refracted in how we see and how we imagine um, the dog sees us in solitude. Thank you. Great. So um, thanks again so much, Tom. Um, yeah, feel free to raise hands either um, with the raise hand function or from your screen or to throw in a question into the chat. I'm happy to read it out. Um, Tom, I, I, I just wanted to start, I guess, in all those images, there's, there's a sort of image of quite a kind of, apart from that one of the dog barking at the musician, dogs are always kind of play this quite placid role. But a lot of people are very scared of dogs. And I guess one image I think of, one slogan is the, associated with dogs is beware the dog, which often comes with this image of a very kind of scary dog, which I think again plays, possibly thinking about that, those last slides you showed of homelessness and, and the dog as a kind of point of protection and potentially playing a role in kind of guarding solitariness as well. I was wondering if that, that whether the role of the dog as a sort of active figure of fear or even a kind of non-human. Um, well, the dog, your point regarding the homeless, as I have tried to suggest, guarding is one of the primal functions of dogs, um, which I think accounts for this dogs and their special relationship with the dead and the loyalty to their dead masters. So in that sense, guarding, like hunting, 
is is rooted in very deep mythic mythic um, a mythic time, and I think the sense that it, um, uh, you know, I think dogs as sort of protecting humans um, it goes way back. I mean, Kamla Lorenz in it. He had this fantasy that the actual jackals were the, uh, the the ancestors of dogs, but in sort of this fictive anthropology, he says um, when the first dog entered the, the first cave uh, in, in in Africa, um, humans slept uh, slept well for the night. So this is kind of mythic sense of, of of that. What's really interesting, the point you make is that for, there are lots of bad dogs, not to speak rabbit dogs, scary dogs. Um, so they're scary. Uh, guard dogs. I mean, Cerberus is a scary dog, and they're um, and but bad dogs are, all, are are rare, and they're almost always depicted um, in, in 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 situation with bad humans. So the Black Legend illustration is the Black Legend has bad dogs, but in those kind of cases, the dogs often end up as better than humans. And once it looks at Las Casas and these people discussing the Black Legend, it'll say the Spanish sent this woman away, planning to have the dog capture and kill her because she was escaping or whatever, and the dogs refused. So the tradition is basically, there's almost no depiction that we think of bad dogs. There is a tradition of better than human dogs, to other, turn your question around. Um, um, iconographically, the most famous is Saint Roche, uh, the type of plague, who um, the humans in the city wouldn't, wouldn't um, wouldn't feed him. He was he was sword and he was kicked out of the city. Um, and a dog uh, uh, brought him bread. So that's the so there's a whole iconography of Saint Roch, especially in, in in Venice, where where um, there's a great um, uh, I guess monastery you call it uh, dedicated to him. So so in your question is it's a good question why scary, bad, rabid, other kinds of dogs aren't depicted in art, but they're not. Yeah. <laughs> so I just thank you. <laughs> um, I think we've got a question. I, I, just, I should say they're in hunting <laughs> scenes. They're not bad dogs. The dogs are what they're doing. So there's the dogs you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley, but they're not after humans. Mm -hmm. You know, they're hunt. They're, they're, they're after game. Okay, we've got a question from Stephanie. Hi. Um, Hi. Firstly, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, really excited to see where the project takes you. Um, but firstly, I thought it's really interesting that these all this artwork requires the viewer to be able to, to translate, I guess, the dog's actions, its movements, its gaze, right? It requires an understanding of dog body language on the part of the viewer, and it assumes that. Mm -hmm. um, my question was, I've, obviously, at some point around the 17th century, you start having the rise of dog portraiture or animal portraiture. And I was just wondering if you see how the dog's gaze works in, in those kinds of uh, works of art, for example, whether it's, you know, sculptural or, you know, 2D, how dog's gaze functions when it hasn't got people to gaze at, I guess. It's a very good question. It's like portraiture. Sometimes they look straight ahead, Some you know, at some point, like the 15th century Renaissance artists discover that the half portrait, you know, the turned head. And I think it's the same thing with dogs. I think dog portraiture follows human portraiture by about half a century. Um, and then by the 19th century, of course, there's an explosion of dog portraiture because there's an explosion of breeds and every breed has its has its dog portraits. But I wouldn't mean, have sort of high art, but in the high art of the period, I mean, I think maybe Fasano is the first one, the Aldrovani Aldo dog at, at Norton Simon, which is like mid 16th century early portrait but i think i don't think there's a characteristic of how the dog looks in the portraits that are just of themselves the portraits with humans it's a lot i mean you you know that in the portrait of the couple walking in the, the, the spitz is her dog and looking at her and not his dog so there's a clear relationship there if you go to the, the next level of this i mean that it just turns out in the in the um the ethology of the dog the dog is remarkably good at following human gazes as you know um and humans following dog gazes. And so that's probably, it, that is, I think, very deep in the in the genetics of, of dogs and humans. And we could go into detail about that. But you're, it's a very interesting question. But, and I haven't really looked at it, but my sense is from looking at a lot of just 
we call it a lot of dog portraits now. It's roughly like human portraits. Thank you. There's a dog, there's a dog looking out. I mean, you had that with human portraits. Charlie, you still there? I'm still here. Okay, right. <laughs> um, Sorry. A lovely looking corgi on the screen. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm I'm trying to show um, I'm trying to show James Moreland's um, Alice. Um, uh, Tom knows Alice's story, and um, I know James is listening. Um, and I just wondered whether um, uh, perhaps um, at some point could we maybe call on James to tell us um, Alice's story because. It exemplifies so much of what Tom has been talking about in this wonderful lecture. Um, we did have a question. Ed had his hand up. Um, Ed, I don't know if you wanted to. Oh, hi. Yeah, no, answer. this this was sorry. My camera isn't working. It was just it was a question about. Um, no, is this Ed? Ed. Ed Sorry, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm sorry, I got it. I'm, I'm sorry, got it. Thank you. Apologies. Um, the well, I've sort of one side point and one question. Um, because you started with the John Berger, Berger, um, essay. I guess is 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 that the one where he's thinking about animals? Yes. Um, yes. And in it, in that book, yeah, yeah. He's also talks about animals becoming completely marginalized through right. modernity. Right. Right. And I was wondering, you know, how much you pick up this theme or if dogs are somehow exempt from this because of their closeness to the human or perhaps even better reflecting this marginalization because I know, you know, the final images of homelessness and COVID um, to the, really the degree to which you agree with this thesis or not or see dogs as sort of beyond it or right. more reflective of it because right. of the relation right. to humans. Right. So look, what I would say is that you, I, I mean, you're absolutely right about Berger. And of course, the, the exemplary case is the horse. Um, and the, just the horse becomes almost sort of an honorary dog as it becomes economically useless. It becomes the, um, the beloved companion, especially of young girls, but not only, not only girls. So he's obviously right. And then you have the rise of zoo animals. Um, I mean, there's a whole, I, I'm, not, I'm not denying this story at all, but what's interesting to me is that I think the story that dogs were uh, once working animals and then no longer working and then became pets, um, part of use is, is not the correct story. Uh, mm. I think we have, we have um, dogs, quote, pets. In fact, one of the earliest examples we have dog-human relationship is a, is, a, is a burial from about 13,000 BC of a woman curled up with a, with a puppy. Uh, cradling a puppy. Um, so we have lots of evidence people just hanging out with dogs. And what's interesting to me is when you start looking at, as soon as you start getting vernacular painting, painting of everyday life rather than mythological painting, people paint them with dogs and you find this in medieval manuscripts and people assume the dogs were sort of hanging out at the time when, um, uh, in the life of Jesus. I mean, so the dogs that are, that are, that are there with the rich man and the, and the, and the, and the beggar um, and so I think the assumption is that dogs are sort of around and hang out with humans, I don't want to say uselessly, but for but not in the context of guarding or, or, or turning spits or, 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 or hunting. So in that sense, I think the Berger story doesn't apply to the, to the, to the, to the, to the dog, though it's certainly the rest of the story about zoos and horses is absolutely right. And in, in short, I think dogs have been, quote, pets, so I'm not sure I like this word, but they, they've been companions independently of the work they do um, for as long as we know. And the dogs that were hanging around, I think sort of magically these, 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 these brickyards of yore 3,000 years ago, you know, obviously weren't working. They were hanging out. Yeah. They were like Thank the you. dogs that walk along. You know, I've, I've, I've poured cement on the sidewalks and the dog put his paw print in it. That's it kind of how I imagine it. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, because also at the beginning of the essay, he talks about the loss of the gaze between the animal and the human, and maybe it's still there in the dog. It's absolutely know? there in the yeah, dog. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, as you know from your work, I mean, the dog, yeah. the dog, you know, the more dog 
labs than, than the ethology labs than pretty much any other species. And as you know, the dog, you work with Pavlov, it's an sort of animal which sort of somehow gets a stand for how human yeah. cognition works. I mean, it, Darwin goes on about it. It is the exempt, it is the animal version of the human. And we, as you, I mean, you know better than I do how this works out in the history of experimentation, but, but I think the dog is just an exception. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I agree. And there was another hand up that um, seems to have disappeared from my screen. So if you do have a question, oh, it's Lucy, Lucy Jack. Hello, a wonderful lecture and my dog is sitting with me. Um, I have a quick question about dogs and statuary. Uh, wow. Two of the most famous ones I'm aware of are Greyfriars Bobby up in yes. Scotland and Hachiko in Tokyo, yes. Yes. both dogs that had the story of being loyal to their humans long after they passed. Is that oh. often the thematic incentive for dog statuary? Some some cases, um, but there are lots of other, uh, you know, there's one of the boxer in Highgate on the, on the tomb. I mean, they're all over the place. Um, they're national dogs. Um, you know, an Irish wolfhound is a statue of an Irish wolfhound on the on the statue of the Irish regiment at Gettysburg. I mean, I, I haven't looked specifically at, at animal sculptures, but but they're but they're all over, and there are medieval capitals as parts of some particular sort of stories. So I think you're absolutely right. Gerfire's Bobby and the dog in Japan are, are famous, but in terms of painting the dog mourning the master, um, there's Lanciers, the the old shepherd's chief mourner. Um, so dogs looking at the graves and mourning is, in pictures is a commonplace. And then, of course, there are dogs on tombs, which are meant to be sort of a faithfulness. But I think it's sort of companions into death. You know, I think it's a sort of like dogs as that are part of grave goods in, in many cultures where dogs are enslaved or killed to be with their and other animals are killed to be with their masters. So I think I think you're right. Those are two famous instances. But I think you have dog sculptures in a, in a lot of contexts. Um, I mean, I just say I haven't specifically um, looked at them. They're obviously also there when you need them um, narratively. I mean, Fontainebleau is full of Diane uh, with, 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 with dogs around them, around her and children sculptures. So, I mean, I think, I think you're right. There are these paradigmatic and famous examples, but, there, but I think there are lots of dog sculptures around in lots of different contexts, maybe not as many contexts as the painting, but in a lot. But I have I, I look into this. Thank you for, for raising the point. Um, we've got a question from Barbara in the chat about the, uh, the ability of dogs to smell as a kind of major oh. sensory apparatus of the dog. Right. I also wanted to add to that it's what is actually understood about the dog's gaze. It's a very good question. So here, so um, the two things is that about this. First of all, um, uh, when the dog smell is the uniquely um, uh, uh, the canine, canine sense. I mean, it's not infinitely better than we do and better than almost any other species. So that's absolutely right. On the other hand, dog, dog vision is not to be sneezed at. Um, I mean, sighthounds are great at, at, at seeing things and these dogs that can catch a frisbee in the air are obviously extremely good um, at seeing. So, but to, in, to, in, in the context of painting and of connection to humans, the following, it's very hard for humans to visual, it's or for painters to visualize uh, smelling. Um, while vision is what painting's about. Um, and, and also when, when um, we know when a dog is looking at us, we sometimes know when the dog is smelling us. So there are paintings of dogs um, that are smelling. But of course, the interesting thing, but most dog, all but the most brachiocephalic dog, when a dog is smelling, its nose is still pointing. So there's something indexical about the dog and looking even when it's primarily smelling, you know, because of just the shape of the dog face. So, so it, I mean, Barbara's absolutely right. Or I think Barbara asked the question, um, uh, I, I've neglected smell, um, and and people who study dog and humans have neglected smell because humans and and dogs relate so much through through um, through vision. At least we relate to them through vision, and they re, they return this relationship through, through through sight rather than through rather or at least as far as we know rather than through smell. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we've got another question from Shokafe. 
Hi, Sophie Faye. Hello. 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 <laughs> Thank you, thank you. That was uh, amazing. Uh, this is uh, so good to bring non-humans into the human. Uh, all, all of our uh, talking about the in this the solitude and the relationship and relating to the other. And uh, I, I was I was wondering just actually after this uh, question of the smell and hearing the go the dogs have been used for their smells in the airport they're used for their hearings and all of that so then i was thinking could this the gaze of the dog if i want how do you think how much how much is our gaze to put in the dog and uh, like in the art is how much of it is are the human's gaze being projected on the dog to show what we want to see or what we see or what we want to show. Well, so in time. It's a really good question. And in some sense, it comes up the philosophical question of other minds. I mean, how do we know that when someone else looks at us, what the intention of the look is? So in some sense, but maybe that's we say it's punting, it's an unfair, it's a it's a it's not a it's not a really um, good answer. The thing about the gaze, the dog's gaze, and our relation to the dog, is that it um, it's um, it works in both it works in both directions. It's very clear the dog looks at us in, in ways when the dog uh, wants us to wants us to do something. So um, experiments have been done, for example, if you give it if you give it a wolf, um, you try to teach a wolf to open containers or find something. The wolf will really work hard at opening a container and will eventually either destroy it or will somehow get the food. The dog tries a little bit and then in about 30 seconds it looks at a human, so, so open the container. Mm -hmm. So I imagine a little bit like when you're going through a door and you're lots of packaging with someone else, you have to ask someone else to open the door. You just look at them and they open the door for you. So mm -hmm. my sense is that dogs, dogs do a huge amount of communication with humans through vision. Mm -hmm. as do wolves when they hunt with each other. So as I say, mm -hmm. the evolutionary story of this is a story probably of, of, of seeing and seeing in, in hierarchically organized context. So my sense is that the dog does a huge amount of it relating with humans by looking at it. Now, whether it's the level of consciousness and what it's actually doing and whether we read this into, the, into them, you know, is sort of mysterious, but it sort of comes from the mysteries of consciousness. I mean, I have nothing... All I, what I tried to say in the paper, and all I want to say is that we imagine them as seeing us in our solitude. Mm -hmm. And when we see these pictures at which I ended, it's obviously meaning something to these people, once from a mental illness discussion, um, once from an adoption, I mean, from different places, we believe that being seen by a dog is being seen by something important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whether they're really, the, the real, I don't, I don't quite know what to say about the you know, the ontology of really, you, see, you know what I mean? So yeah, in some it, sense, it, it's like the really of any kind of someone looking at us. I mean, you, you want to, you're looking at me in a sort of understanding way. Are you really thinking that was a load of crap? You know what I mean? I mean, I assume, I hope you're not, but, but there has to be some version. Of, and let me just make one other point about seeing is that do, in dog evolution, um, they've clearly learned the evolution has created has selected for dogs which act like they're interested. So for example, in the oldest breeds of dogs and in wolves, they don't have the muscles, the orbiculars, or allow them to raise their eyebrows. Okay. But they think that about 3,000 years ago, just a few years ago, someone did this study, the dog, you had dogs that could raise its eyebrows like you're doing, which shows, which is a gesture in humans of being interested. So dogs that at least could appear to people as being interested that had, a, had a, an evolutionarily better shot at hanging out with humans than not. So, so again, it's, I don't know, I don't know, I can't get inside the dog, but all sorts of things about the dog make us think that it's, yeah. it is meaningful. I, I, I didn't want, I mean, it wasn't saying something refuting what you said. I'm just adding that the, also his communication is back and forth, that how yes. much 
Absolutely. they give us and how much we put in them and that exactly this back and forth is going to create a different kind of a relationship through the history and absolutely yeah. absolutely absolutely and we, we do it with some other animals and people or horse people do it with with horses but you don't put horses into your house <laughs> so, i mean the dog has this particular it's in the domus right no i didn't mean to, i'm sorry i didn't quite understand yeah. the fortune your question point taken absolutely thank you right. thank you I don't think that was a question. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has anything. Please put your hand up or put something, write something in the chat. Um, I'll jump in again if um, no one has anything straight away. This is like, I guess it's a big question about the book and the project, but why, why art um, in particular? Because I guess your work's so interdisciplinary and seems to be a lot of, you're thinking about it, the dog, when you talk about the dog, you're thinking about it through scientific representations and, and philosophical representations and, and human dog relationships. So. I guess, what is it about art? Well, I don't, when I, you know, in a larger version of this, I try to articulate the art with, 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 with obviously with literary sources. So I don't mean to, I, um, I, you know, so I don't, I, I mean, I take your, I didn't talk about literary sources today, but one, one certainly could. But what, I guess what I didn't want to do in this project is, is, the kind of intellectual history of good dog versus bad dog. I mean, there's a lot of literature, dogs are dirty and they're filthy and they're what? No, they're not. They're actually clean and virtuous and so forth. And there's a whole literature about you know bad dogs and not bad dogs. And it goes back to to you know to antiquity. And I and I just didn't I, I wasn't I didn't want to rehearse that sort of intellectual history of the dog. But dogs and literature are hugely interesting and important and and uh, Especially in modern literature, and Berger has a novel about dogs, and uh, and um, uh, you, you know a uh, 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 great Israeli novelist, Agnon, is a dog is absolutely central to one of his novels, and I mean, I mean, there are, there are score, scores of interesting dog novels, and you know Emily Dickinson's it is interesting about dogs, and the Brontes, and this is God knows Virginia Woolf does about you know Bear Browning's dog. I mean, there's a whole world of that, and I try to allude to it. But I suppose what I got interested in, I mean, I'll be back on how I got interested in this project. I was asked 15 years ago to give a lecture uh, for an art exhibit called the, the, the New Child in 18th Century Art, in British Art. And it had all sorts of, it had that picture I showed you earlier. It had a lot of Hogarth and Reynolds, I mean, the, the great canon of that art. Um, and I opened the lecture by saying, well, look, I think, I think um, I'm going to talk about the new child, but the lecture could have been about the new dog. So then I thought, well, okay, the British are crazy about dogs and dogs and children in particular, and this is kind of a, 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 a feature of this particular 18th century exhibition. And then when I started thinking about it, I, looking at it, I realized as I tried to suggest in the lecture that these dogs are really everywhere in the canon. And so the question that it raises, why? I mean, Dury didn't have to have three dogs and all have dogs in every one of his master prints. And Giotto invented the dog in this and three of the six Poesy paintings, which are you know as great as any, didn't have to have a dog, and 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 Velasquez didn't need to put a dog in Las Meninas, and so the question started to me: Why do people, you know, at the Shakespeare do it? I mean, this level of thinking. I mean, these, these are the great, in, imagine, you know, in thinkers of of the world have these have these dogs, so that became the question that puzzled me. You now you could you could say why do I mean, I guess, why does Turgenev write short stories about dogs? And Tolstoy, I mean, it's another set of questions. But, but, but I was just struck by the, by the centrality of these dogs, not only in the canon, but then everywhere else. And so when you, you I mean, after hearing this lecture, go through the National Gallery, any art museum you want to, and you'll find the body everywhere. I mean, it's really big, four big Veronese's features of love. One of them has this terrific dog. All these big Rubens have dogs. Um, I mean, I can just, I mean, I could, you know, spend hours telling you about this painting or that painting. So that's why it, it became a, it became an interesting historical question. And then, the, and then, of course, 
And then the question of the, why dogs appear in early in early cinema is another interesting question. And then their explosion in, in snapshots becomes a question. And so it's just it's the sheer um, presentness uh, of the dog and the visual culture that I that I want you know to talk about. So I mean, I mean it's not that the other question is not interesting, and one couldn't write interestingly about it. And people have written interestingly about about dogs and Dickens and dogs and Hardy and dogs and Turgenev. I mean, all these things are topics, but I don't think anyone has sort of taken the dog as we really, really puzzled by this question of the dog in the visual in the this long visual tradition which goes back to the Greeks. And then and then it doesn't exist in some other cultures, but once the Japanese get dogs in the 19th century, they're all over Japanese art as well. So I mean it, it's, they're kind of irresistible subjects. And I'm interested in why. Yeah. A question from Barbara. You're on mute, Barbara. But don't forget, the chief, well, James's story is still interesting, and we want to bring that in at some point, Charlie, if you have time. You're still on mute, Barbara. Unmute. There you okay. are. There you are. Here I am. Um, I just I, I, I see present at um, this event um, many people who, uh, in addition to James, and there's a, a link uh, now to uh, James's blog about Alice um, on the chat. Um, and, I, and I don't know whether James is, is is going to come in and say anything more about about um, Alice. Um, but um, and her very 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 touching history. Um, but I also um, see Piers Torde, um, whose um, uh, dog Huxley, I believe, is about to visit us um, after this um, after this lecture. Um, and uh, and I see um, Sarah Knott, who um, who has um, a, a wonderful dog um, back um, in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. Um, I, um, uh, so I think, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to hear a little bit more, maybe from, um, other people. I'm, I'm sure that there are many, um, dog lovers and people for, uh, whose lives, including, uh, Tom himself, I should say, um, whose many dogs, um, I have had the privilege or a whole series of dogs of meeting and enjoying, uh, over the years. So... Uh, that's it from me, and if someone could mute me, I will lower my hand. Well, I would love to hear. I just want to say that I'm hoping this dog, this 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 book, will appeal to cat lovers. And I have a section on cats, um, and I just want to be clear that I'm, I'm I've had a cat. I don't not anti cat or anti horse. Now let's let people speak about their dogs. We do have a dog on screen. <laughs> I think James is. <laughs> there with Travis and Alice. Hello, uh, we thought we'd give a little view of the unofficial project dog <laughs> who might want to gaze at the camera, she might not. Um, not at you. <laughs> of course. Um, so yeah, you can read my blog on our, on our website um, to kind of have a bit more of the background of our story of I mean when we both met each other my <coughs> husband and I um we kind of bonded on our love of corgis um and during covid um lockdowns I was diagnosed with a chronic illness which kind of separated me out more from the rest of society um and our families um so kind of the the imaginings of having a dog with us was something that kind of got us through um, those few months. Um, and just as the blog was published on our website, we had news that we were the chosen adopted household of little Alice here, who's a little corgi who came from us from China. Um, so she was rescued from the meat trade um, in China. Um, and then rescued from another shelter where she was uh, treated incredibly poorly um, and brought over to the UK by a charity. Um, but kind of what's been 
amazing for us is that we obviously don't know her background at all. Um, she has scars on her muzzle and her ears, so she's obviously been in some dog fights in her past, but the one thing that is kind of continuous throughout her anxieties of other dogs is her absolute adoration of any human. Um, as soon as she arrived, within 24 hours, she was up staring at us, licking our hands and kind of nuzzling, knowing that well, it felt like she knew uh, of you know what had happened and where she'd come from. Um, but what was really on my mind kind of listening to Tom's talk is that gaze of the dog is something that's incredibly hard to put into words, um, potentially better in visuals of um, almost the dog teaching you another language of sight, of being able to try and read the dog through their eye shape. You know, if it's slightly more album shape, her trying to show that she loves you. Um, and yeah, it's just fascinating to kind of see that history of the dog's gaze, which I don't know, is, is definitely a whole a whole different language. Um, being portrayed in, in a visual way seems to kind of make the most sense to me as a dog owner anyway. Well, another point that the dog listening is portrayed in art too, it, it's really what the point that I wanted to make is, you, you, you said it, it's, it's, the, it's this mutual attention that seems to me what brings it in, speaks to the dog's place in solitude and, the, and why the dog has become, why the dog or interest in dogs has, has grown during this period of isolation. Um, but it's been a feature of dogs and humans for a long time. Lots of examples of dogs in the poor and beggars with dogs and so forth. I mean, it's, you know, it's a long, it's a long story and recorded, yeah, it's a long story. I think it's interesting, this kind of difference between the, in those pictures, the dog that's kind of a welcome presence and the dog that is just kind of there because it, right. it exists right. with humans. Right. Is there a distinction like well, being look, seen? Well, I, I, in... I think that's right. I mean, I think, look, there are dogs that are just sort of central to the way the painting work. I mean, look, you could argue if a painter of the caliber of the painters, I mean, showing you puts an animal in its central. I mean, you can't say this would be just as good a painting without the dog. I mean, there's a reason these guys put the dogs in. So I don't want to start imagining you know, a different painting without the dog. But you're right. There's some dogs which are where, where the where they're where they're central. The Titian, the three dogs in the Titian painting, you just they're just crucial for all sorts of reasons. And in the Veronese's, um, and in lots and in and in the Corbettes, I mean in lots of things. But in other cases. Is sort of there, and I think in some sense in the visual arts, the, the, it's what I say. Sort of the thereness of dogs is a kind of how to put it. Um, uh, um, well, um, maybe these just painters need this a, a, a different sorts of witness because what's so striking is how many different places are just sort of there. I mean, all these pictures of Dutch churches and imagine Dutch churches that they're looking at the scene. So they become sort of part of this post the 16th, post 16th century. And I think maybe in some of these illuminations as well, sort of a representation of fairness, you know, of, of, of some um, presence. And I think that's what's, what, what I think, what's so striking about the dog in the Dura, the heaviness. I mean, you could say, yes, dog were melancholy because, because of, of, you know, the, 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 the humors and so forth. But it's, it's not sort of that, it's just that it's the presence and the heaviness of the dog and the dog sort of just present in the study. And that's what you get with these dogs and so many of these other, of these other situations. And I was sort of, as I, I mentioned briefly, the Edison story, I was sort of struck at the very beginning. So Edison films, maybe his first film, and he shows a man exercising for 30 seconds or 45 seconds doing deep knee bends and lifting a baton. And he puts the dog in the picture watching him. I mean, you ask yourself, you know. How do you know that he put the put the dog there or the 
So go well, it's not. Bec- I mean, I guess I'm contrasting the Lumiere films and other early films in which it's clear the dog sort of wanders into the picture. I mean, where you see people, you know, the Lumiere movie where they're leaving the factory, or the one about the fake beggar, where the you know the guy just walks, the cop chasing the beggar, the legless beggar just walks away, and you just have a dog wanders into the picture. And that just clear the Lumiere where they set up a camera somewhere in Paris, and the dog walked in, and likewise at the factory gate. While the Edison, the very, I think maybe the first Edison was actually staged. And he stages it with a dog watching a person exercising. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it seems to me why this first happened, I don't know, but it becomes a visual tradition of dogs watching and, and, and present and the people who did early movies did it. So you have, and then all the endless dogs in these early card, you know, in this photography is, um, is it, you know, just they're sort of there when when one has a new a new uh, form of, of in, in a new way of producing images. So it's a good question. I mean, I don't know the. I mean, I don't know a deeper answer than this one. The suggest or the one I tried to suggest in this thing about the need to be seen. And this represents somehow an, another version of being seen. I don't, I don't quite know how I would get it. You know, research it more than showing it in different. In the, the liveliness of this tradition. That, you know. There's another um, comment just coming on the chat. Uh, um, it says, thank you for a wonderful and suggestive talk. Hawking writes and paints eloquently about his various dogs, including in lockdown. His little dog, Ruby, is often seen with him as he sits and draws. Um, <clears throat> she sits by his nose with her chair with her nose up, looking at what he's, right, right, he's right. looking at. Right. But this um, is what, what you're drawing is another trope. I mean, Walter Scott's dogs are everywhere. I mean, this, the number, I mean, I haven't I just touched the dogs in the studies. He's a, you know, Freud, a matter of wolf. I mean, you know, you go through the list, people. And partly because dogs will actually sit around while cats will and won't. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, so they keep you company while you're doing a long thing. We are, um, it's 7 30. I don't know if, if there's any last burning questions. Um, please raise your hand now. If not, um, please join me in thanking Tom LeCur for right. such a wonderful lecture. And on behalf of the project, Queen Mary. Um, it's been completely wonderful having you over. Um, well, I thank you too, Charlie, for chairing this and thank the audience for the interesting questions. Um, Barbara and Norma for hosting this, the, the computer. So I um, thank everyone.